Yeah, Ranvija, you can start the recording. So uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome once again to uh, the ISHEL conversation uh, series. And today we are talking to Dr. Laura Patterson Rosa. Uh, she is a PhD in animal science and genomics. Uh, she has done research in genomics of equine health, ancestry, coat color, and uh, neurogenetics. Um, and um, I will invite uh, uh, Dr. Patterson to introduce herself to the members uh, present today. Uh, but before that, I would just like to uh, highlight uh, what this conversation is all about and what ISHEL is all about. Uh, ISHEL is the Indigenous uh, Sport Horse Equestrian League, and we are working with uh, the Indigenous horse breeds of India uh, at core to uh, have them introduced into the modern day equestrian sport uh, so that, uh, you know, they, they find some value, they find some uh, good grounding in terms of what they are used for because in currently in the uh, equestrian scene uh, of India, these horses are basically sidelined. So our project is working with these indigenous horses. A part of this project, we are working with education and education, not only in the basics of equestrian discipline, but also the knowledge around it. Uh, and one of the uh, reasons why we are having this conversation is uh, basically for the same reason. So we will be understanding more on the equine genetics. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding or there's a lot of belief in terms of the breeds of uh, India itself. And there's some DNA work that uh, is being done or will be done in future as well. But for the information of the members, it is good to understand the basics uh, of what, uh, you know, when we say equine genetics, what does it mean? How does it help us? Where does it take it, uh, you know, uh, from, from, from the equine management point of view and how the project can benefit from this subject. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the topic of uh, discussion today. Uh, Dr. Laura, can I ask you to uh, introduce yourselves to the uh, panel, please? And welcome once again. Thank you so much for taking the time out for having this conversation with ISHEL. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank to ISHEL, too, for having me here today. It's a pleasure being here and talking genetics. So um, <clears throat> I'm a, a veterinarian and equine geneticist, so I'm originally from Brazil. And I moved to the United States in 2015 to do my PhD in animal science and equine genetics uh, with focus on equine health. So after that, I pursued a postdoc and now I'm a professional uh, faculty member at Sol Ross State University. But before that, I worked for a year with a genetics testing company, which I'm still a scientific consultant for them. So <laughs> basically I'm a veterinarian with uh, a, a large, very large expertise in genomics. So yeah, I will be trying to cover most of the genetics that are applicable for horse owners and breeders today. And how can you make use of that information to improve your horses, to make sure that they're healthy, to select them uh, and to maintain the breeds. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Patterson. And welcome to the project as well, not only to the conversation and <laughs> meeting ISHEL. I'm sure uh, there's, there's lots of work that we'll be going to do together on this. Paula, thank you so much for the introduction um, of Dr. Patterson to the project. I think that's uh, a huge contribution from your side uh, to the project. Thank you so much for that. Um, I would like to invite uh, some of our participants today uh, to introduce themselves. They are participants of note. And I'll start with Dr. Anne, please. Dr. Anne, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Dr. Anne Steiger. Um, I'm also an equine geneticist. Uh, I did my PhD at Cornell University looking at gait confirmation and behavior. Uh, after that, I did a couple of postdocs, one at Cornell University looking at other livestock species, and then another one at Uppsala University in Sweden, looking at the evolution of gait in horses. Um, 
I did two years as a visiting assistant professor at Auburn University, and now I'm an assistant professor at Texas A&M Kingsville. We're working on behavior and performance traits in horses and cattle, because I have to work on cows too, but that's me. <laughs> Fantastic. That's such an interesting subject for us. You know, we, um, some of our horses have special gait called uh, Reval uh, in the Marwaris and the Katiawaris, but we'll talk more about that as we go into the conversation. Uh, Dr. Rahi, if we can have your introduction, please. Uh, yes, again, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I am Rahi, PhD in animal breeding and genetics, graduated from Tehran University. I spent most of 2018 in uh, Cornell University, worked with Dr. Anzak, and uh, we work on genetic diversity and se uh, selection signature in Arabian horses. Uh, after my PhD, I started working uh, with uh, Equestrian Federation of Iran and uh, uh, right now, I am the head of the stud book office uh, of the Federation, and we are uh, doing all of the uh, work related to the horse registration, passport issue, uh, DNA test. And also, uh, I have a good collaboration with some uh, uh, universities in Iran and advising their uh, research. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rai. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, in our discussion today. Uh, next, I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Vartika to uh, introduce herself. Uh, I would also like to uh, let all the members know that uh, Dr. Vartika is uh, a member of ISHEL and would also want to contribute and work towards the, uh, uh, the benefits of the indigenous horse breeds of India. And that's why she's on the project. But more importantly, she represents the scientific uh, domain on the project itself and uh, some of the discussions that we have on the project from a scientific uh, uh, analysis and research point of view uh, she is eager to be a part of and contribute dr vartika if you can introduce yourself please thank you mr sharma thank you so much for inviting me today so i am uh, dr vartika shrivastava i did my phd in biotechnology now I'm uh, working as a medical scientist in Department of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases in Wits Medical School. And I'm also collaborating with Shirley Masheki Hospital, which is a general uh, Joburg hospital. Uh, I'm running a research program uh, within the department and I'm uh, authorized to train the PhD students, but we are basically focused on um, microbiology or medical microbiology. So uh, we deal with bacterial as well as fungal pathogens and we're looking for the solutions to combat these, these diseases. So uh, I'm new to equine genetics, but I'm very curious to know about this topic. So um, I thank once again to Vimal Sharmas that he invited me today. Thank you so much, Vimal. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Vartika. Um, Paula, I would like you to, uh, you know, uh, I, I would like for the members to have your introduction once again. I know you have been in our conversation with ISHEL, uh, but this is a very specific uh, conversation that has been brought together uh, by your efforts and also your interest in the indigenous breed of horses. So if you can have just a brief introduction of yourself for the members, once again. You, you mean me? Uh, yes, yeah, Paula. Ah, okay, so I'm a, an equine journalist and photographer, and um, I have a book about the Marwari horse in, in India. And uh, I've always been very interested on native breeds of every country especially on the countries that still have endangered breeds. And um, one of the things that have really made a change, a change in the last 15 years is the, the study of the DNA. It has really made a change. So for me, it was important to help to get a, a pool of uh, experts on that from different countries because intercultural things and uh, uh, the, the point of view of different uh, people from different places with different breeds. When everyone comes together, it's, uh, it makes wonders. It's really completely different of a conference of experts and that is it. It's much more, it's, it's much richer. So I think that uh, these series of educational videos that you are doing 
and that you are promoting with your breeders and your owners of courses are fantastic. They, they will make a difference. They are already making a difference. And I, I really thank you for all you're doing because uh, it's really something that uh, is going to be seeing the, the benefits in an year or two years, but you're going to see the benefits of these seeds that you're putting down. And that is all. I mean, about me, that's all. I'm a German photographer and uh, I, <laughs> I was an instructor, a horse instructor for 10 years or so. I had um, a breeding farm of Arabians for 30 years. Uh, I know very well horses since I was a child. And uh, I've been traveling for many countries in many countries. So by seeing many breeds of horses used for different things from the agricultural to saddle to driving, whatever, also completed a bit my vision about the horse world because sometimes we think that only the saddle horses exist. There is much more than that. There are countries where saddle horses are a luxury. And there are countries where uh, they just don't exist. Donkeys are the, the protagonists of everything. So we must think that uh, the world is very, very uh, different according to the places that we consider. And uh, the more we try to bring knowledge to everyone, the better everyone will do and the better the horses will be. And better care, better looked after, more awareness of the owners and all that. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Thank you uh, not only uh, uh, for being uh, a friend, but also contributing so much uh, to the project that is close to uh, personally my heart and all the members of ISHL as well. I think you are doing uh, a fantastic work uh, for propelling this project forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Ranvijay, can I can we have Dr. Paula share her screen and then we can delve into the uh, presentation? Uh, Dr. Laura, please. Yes. Um, there we go. Fantastic. We can working? see the screen. Yeah. All right. So can I'll just see? let uh, I'll just set up uh, some ground rules over here. Uh, if uh, we can have the presentation continue. If people have questions and they can be parked, please uh, write them down in the chat box and we will pick the questions at the appropriate time uh, in the session. If you think that there's a question that we need to ask uh, then and there, uh, you are more than happy to you know, uh, raise your hand and then uh, we will attend to the questions. Yes, uh, Dr. Patterson. Okay, can you, can you see my screen well? Can you see my mouse too? Yes. Me? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So, welcome everybody. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the benefits of DNA testing for horses. Okay. So, bear with me for a little bit. <clears throat> and I wanted to start out by asking the question, the crucial question: Why does it matter? Why does DNA testing and why the DNA knowledge of what the horse has and can transmit to the offspring matters to us? So let's say that I am a horse breeder and I have these four horses here, one, two, three, and four. And I don't know which horses I want to keep for myself, which ones, which ones I want to sell, which ones will be good for breeding, which ones fit my program and my goals of breeding in the future. So I can look at these horses' characteristics. I can look at their phenotypes which is the visible traits, visible traits that we can observe on them. And I can select based on that, but that doesn't give me the actual knowledge if that trait that I see is gonna be passed on to the next generation. And this is ultimately what matters to me, okay? As a breeder, I want that trait to be passed on to the next generation. So if I'm a horse breeder, I go and I get a DNA test, and that gives me plenty of tools that gives me like a of an immense toolbox to which to play with. So I will have all the information 
information or everything that horse has known until of now, of course, because there's still the things that we scientists are still working on, but that will give me all the information to select my herd of horses better and to make sure that they're not only healthy, but they have the traits that I like and that I want to pass on forward or that the breed wants. Like I said, it's very important to maintain our horses healthy. And this is one of the important things of using genetics to our own benefits and to the horse's benefits. So it doesn't have an actual study. There's not an actual study on horses on, on the allele frequencies and the chances of horses having diseases. But I can compare horses to people because genetically we are somewhat similar. So one in each three people, so meaning one in each three of us here in this meeting has a recessive lethal, which means that if that lethal was combined to another lethal in someone else's, it would not generate offspring. So the offspring wouldn't be born. And each person, each one of us here, for example, has 40 to 110 disease variants, which means that we carry as a recessive disease, well, 40 to 110. Horses might be similar in that sense as well. So how does those <clears throat> two recessive lethals meet in an offspring? In humans, is a little bit more rare. It's not as common. But in horses, to maintain breeds and to build traits that we like, we interbreed them with their own siblings. So we use inbreeding or line breeding. And with that, we increase the odds of those two alleles, those two genetic variations that are recessive and they're not good for the next generation to meet in the offspring. Also, it's important to note that a lot of the genes, a lot of the variations that we see in horses, in a lot of the genes that we have in people too, they control for more than one trait for more than one characteristic. So if you see a coat color variation, sometimes that coat color variation also has implications on other things. So for example, there is one coat color variation called Splash White 7 that was recently discovered that makes all horses deaf so they can't hear, which horses can adapt very well to that life ending <laughs> situation. But if we know that they have splashed white seven, we also know that they will be deaf, okay? All right, so some of the things that we can select for. First and foremost, color, which is a great thing. Humans love beautiful things. And it's, it's an intrinsic natural thing that we enjoy pretty things. And as humans, we also enjoy different colors. We enjoy looking at different things. We enjoy looking at horses that have beautiful colors. If you're looking at the phenotype, at, at the characteristic of each horse, you don't necessarily know what that horse is hiding in its genetics. But if you look at the actual genetics, you not only know what that horse has, but what the potential on passing that forward is. So we can select for the base coat colors like black and chestnut. And important thing to note here, I'm using the nomenclatures that are associated with genetics, okay? I'm not using because I know in Brazil, for example, there's a lot of variation within each state. So they change the names of the colors based on the breed, based on the state, based on the location where they're coming from. So here I'll be using the nomenclatures, the names for the colors that are associated with the genetics of that color, okay? What happened? They have the gray, but what is an actual base color of that? That's very important to know if you're selecting for color. 
So also dilutions like the Palomino color, which is a cream, done, champagne, silver, pearl, snowdrop, sunshine. There's so many that we can select for. And knowing the actual genetics help us do that, okay? So let's say that, for example, I wanted to breed my two black horses. So these are two horses from Brazil. Okay, they, uh, on one side you have a Mangalarga marchador and the other one you have a Mangalarga, um, to which I also believe that they have some influence of native Indian breeds because they do have the ears that resemble some of the Marwari ears. They have the little tips that flip inwards. So if I look at these two horses and I look at their characteristics, I look at their phenotypes, I would probably say, well, I can't make a cream horse with blue eyes from these breeding, right? Yeah, well, the phenotype doesn't tell me much, but if I genetic tested them, then I would know that each one of them carries hidden in their genomes, a cream allele. See, the CR means cream. So they might be black, but they have a hidden cream. And with two hidden creams, you end up with a horse that is cream colored with blue eyes. So by knowing the genotype of your horse, you're able to select to the traits that you wanna produce on the next generation, even if you don't see that traits in your own horses, okay? So this is pretty, pretty cool, right? <laughs> What else can we select for? Yes, you have a question, Ms. Vimal? Uh, I, and perhaps we can park that question for a bit later. Two, uh, uh, two interesting things that I would like to know more about is the, the breed of the horse that you were talking about that has similarities in terms of the inward curved ears to the Indian horses. Then the other thing was, uh, the cream color with uh, blue-eyed uh, horses, which we generally call the nukra in the- Ah, Indian. we'll talk about the nukra too. So it could be okay, the nukra, okay, cool. so, yes. That's a good point, that's a great point, thank you. So it could be the thank nukra, you. so I'll come back here. Um, if you ever observe okay. a horse that looks creamed like this and has blue eyes, it is likely that it has two cream alleles, okay? The base color can be any because any horse that has two creams will be double dilute with blue eyes. We call it double dilutes. So um, not even just cream, but other alleles on the cream on the same gene that causes cream can also lead to the same uh, visual characteristics that we see on this horse. This is this is a, actually a, a Lusitano. This is not, but it was just an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yes, but would, would if, they also have the pink skin? Um, the skin will be diluted. It will be pink, but not because uh -huh. of the lack of melanocytes. It's because the pigment uh -huh. is diluted. It's like getting that color and putting a lot of water in it. So you're diluting that color. What we're going to see now is slightly different. So when I talk about whites, and I'm talking about, let's say, see the white markings on the full here are the socks on this other horse or the white on the face of this horse here. So these are whites and we can select for that as well. So we can select for Tobiano markings, which are kind of similar to this horse here. He has a Tobiano, which are more vertical and white patches on the body. These white patches don't have color in them. They don't have melanocytes, which are the cells that make color. So it's different from the horse that is cream with blue eyes. This one actually does not have any color in the white patches. We can select for Framo Vero, which is uh, which is important to know if the horse carries Framo Vero, because if you have two copies, it means that the foal will die, okay, of this one here, lethal white Overo. We can select for Sabino, we can select for dominant whites. So dominant whites, we have up to 34 right now and more and more keeps uh, being discovered. 
And we can select for splashed whites like this black horse here, which it will be, it's called splash because it almost looks like you grabbed the horse by its back and you dipped it in white paint. So it starts out by the legs and it goes up to the face and it grows through the body up to the back of the horse. And if we know that our horses have these specific genetic variants, we can select towards them or we can select against. If we don't like it, if we don't want that, we can re absolutely remove it from our breeding herd if we desire so. So here are some examples of what the, the variation on those phenotypes, on those visual characteristics for the Ws or the dominant whites can be. So like I said, there's one through all the way through 34 at the moment. And it can vary from patches of white within the belly or just socks and a blaze or just a white head or the horse can be completely white. Does it remember anything? The nucras, right? Completely white with dark eyes, with black eyes instead of blue eyes. Yeah, but that also- Here are two examples. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. So if, if you see a horse that is white with black eyes, it is likely caused by a dominant white variant. The question here is that I don't know which white variant do, does those horses have. And given that these Marwari, Kachawari, and Nukra breeds are very ancient, they probably come way before most of the things that we know. It might be a completely new, undiscovered dominant white. Okay, and we keep finding more and more. So there's a lot of them out there. But the question here is, which one do they actually have? And I stole those pictures from, from Facebook. So I don't know exactly who these horses belong to. I just want to show examples within that Nucra population of horses. They're gorgeous horses. They're very well selected. But what is that dominant white that they carry that is making them completely white with black eyes? I can't tell you that. I don't know. What I can tell you is that I recently discovered four. So that is, that is the latest one that we know <clears throat> that by itself, it has a very large impact on horses that are chestnut based or red based. And I found it on Arabian horses. I found it on Brazil. Um, that basically came from the Iberian horses. And I also found it in association with the W19. So uh, this is an example here on, on the right-hand side of a horse that has both W34 and homozygosity or two copies of W34 and two copies of W19. So he looks almost completely white <clears throat> with just a, a leftover. He was born that color. He, was, he didn't gray out with time, okay? So what we see too is that you can make, if you like that kind of color, you can make horses with large, long uh, white legs, and maybe a little white spot on the belly. All right. What are some other characteristics that we can use in genetics select for? There is a temperament test. So I was very skeptical about that one at first, but um, it holds up pretty well. It's a, it's a gene that is related to dopamine receptors. So dopamine receptors are some of the things that change in humans, how we perceive the world. So if we're happy, if we're sad, if we are upset with something. Uh, in humans, mutations in that same gene have caused people to be more prone for uh, going to adventures, jumping out of planes, liking roller coasters, things like that. So we do know that there is, there is a temperament component in that variation. In horses, what they discovered 
is that that variation is related to curiosity. If the horse has one type, or if the horse has another type of that gene is correlated to vigilance behaviors. So curiosity is that horse that is very, gets into everything. Um, it's very friendly towards people. It will always be around people. It will always like being petted, but at the same time will have a low attention span. And the vigilance horses are usually the sport horses that professionals like. They're very focused, very driven, and very attained to rules. So if you set up a rule, the horse will attend to that rule and not change it. And if you do not get to that rule right, so let's say that uh, the rule is setting the distance to a jump properly, and you get that distance wrong is the horse that is going to punish you, okay? But they also make amazing, amazing sport horses because of that. We can also select for something that is called a tiger eye. So like this horse in the image here, it has a yellow or honey colored eye. In some breeds, some Iberian breeds have that. I'm not aware if any of the native indigenous Indian breeds have it, but it's something that can be selected for if you like that. I, yes. I have one at my stable. Yeah. There you go. So if you too. have a tiger eye, and by yeah, knowing yeah, the I'm genetics, sure. you can find ones that carry that variation but are not showing it. So you can breed to the one that you have that is showing it to make offspring that is actually showing tiger if you like it. If you don't like it, you can remove it from your population. It's up to you. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a variation. The beliefs that people have, uh, but, uh, but yeah, good to know. select for those honey colored eyes you can also interfere on the movement of the horse so this one was published in 2012 uh, it's called the gatekeeper so what we know now is that that variation that genetic variation is able to keep the horse in its intermediate speed gait so uh reval is it Reval? Am I saying it right? I'm sorry if I'm butchering the word. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's right. You, you can, yeah, Reval is, yes. yeah. Okay, so Reval and some of the gates that we observe in, in North American breeds, South American breeds, so the four beat gates. Some of these breeds do carry that mutation because they were selected to maintain that speed, likely selected to maintain that speed in higher, or that gate in higher speeds. I'm gonna show an example of that. And it's a breed that does carry that mutation and they call it the five gate mutation because they can then maintain one of their gates within higher speeds. And also height. So would you like your horse to be taller? Would you like your horse to be smaller? Are you selecting towards pony sized horses? Are you selecting towards the more taller cohorts of, of a certain breed. So yes, there are genetic variations that can be used for that purpose. For example, here, this, these two horses here are two gypsy vanners, registered gypsy vanners, and they're very different in height. One has a, a the withers height is a 1.65 meters height. So he's a very tall horse. And the other one is uh, only 1.32, so pony sized. So what is the variation between those two horses here? So there's two genetic variants that we know now. So we call them uh, height one and height two, H1 and H2. One is associated to taller horses. It can make horses taller by 7.3 centimeters, give or take. And the other one is associated to shorter horses. It can make horses smaller by 19, almost 20 centimeters. Can you imagine that? Almost a whole hand smaller. So that's a lot, that's a lot, okay? And you can use that information within your own herd of horses to select for the things that you like or what the breed desires. So breeds in Brazil have limitations on height. So they cannot be taller than or smaller than a certain height. 
this is a tool that they can use on their toolbox to make sure that the horses will not go over or under that limitation. And as I said, the DMRT3 or the locomotion effect. So if we look at how Icelandic horses move, for example, let me see if it will play. I hope it will. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, I don't think my video is playing. Uh, I can I can send that video to you later on. Um, but can you get off my connection? Um, it's it's something with the video. It's not playing. Either way. So what the DMRT3 does is that it can make the same horse move at the intermediate speed at higher speeds without going into the canter or the gallop. So standard breads, trotters, and pacers have that mutation. Some of the Brazilian breeds have that mutation as well. And even quarter horses, paint horses, things like that sometimes have it in very low frequencies, very low frequencies. I don't know about the native breeds there, but it would be something interesting to look at. Um, and this is this is a beginning for a study that is broader in looking at differences in the horse's movement. So if we want to know why a horse moved the way it does, it's in the genetics because that same characteristic can be passed on to the next generation, right? <clears throat> so it's the same idea. And Moving on to health. So what do we know about health? There is over 30 health conditions of genetic origin in the horse that can be tested for commercially and more coming out every year. That, that's just like the baseline knowledge that we have. <clears throat> Most of these conditions are not exclusive to breed. So why would a breeder wanna know if their horses are carriers for something bad? Um, because that way they can plan ahead or they can make decisions with knowledge. So knowledge-based decisions on what to do with that horse. By testing your horse, apply that information. You don't have to wait 11 months to get a full that is sick or that is going to die in order to remove that animal from your breeding or decide to do a different breeding. So you can plan ahead and this is based on actual knowledge. So removing the horse from breeding, keeping the horse and maybe breeding that horse to somebody else, to some other horse, not the one that you bred before. Uh, some of these diseases also can be managed with different tools. So you can use nutrition, you can use training, you can use medical managements. If you're aware that the horse has that genetic disease, you can manage that before it turns into an actual issue. Like I said, selection and the proper management are key. It's not that you're going to know that your horse has a disease and you're going to entirely give up on that individual animal. If it is a, a, an, a, an individual horse that is important for you or is important for the breed or it has characteristics that you like, you can then breed it to horses that do not carry that. And then on the next generation, you can entirely erase that genetic disease from your population. So it's all about selection. It's all about having the tools to be able to do proper selection. So in this case here, this is a horse from Brazil that was also tested by the company that I used to work for. What we found is that he's heterozygous black and red which means that he has one black allele and one red allele. He does not have the agouti variant. So he, his base color is black. He has a dun marking. So which makes the body dilute to a, a gruya color. So a, a dun color and zebra stripes. And he is a carrier for the risk, increased risk of developing uh, laryngeal hemiplasia. So roaring horses. He is also more susceptible for West Nile virus, which means
good. It's good to know that, right? He's also DMRT3 carrier, meaning that he has that genetic mutation that will change his speed. Yes. Hey, Green uh, froze for some time. Uh, we were talking about uh, just after the zebra marking, uh, you said the uh, screen froze. Uh, I think you were talking about the Western Nile uh, virus. Yes, Western Nile virus. Yeah. So the zebra markings that he has right here, yeah. it's still unknown. So we do have tests for that. It's called brindle in horses. We do have tests for brindle, but not every brindle horse has the same variation for brindle that we know of. So we do need to find more horses that have those genetics of brindle in order to be able to develop more tests that will capture that variation. It's just like the white, the dominant white. So uh, we now have two brindles. There's probably thousands out there. I don't know. <laughs> but yes, this is a very good point. He does have a brindle. This is one of the reasons why the owner tested with us because they wanted to know if he had one of the known brindles. He didn't, but he does show the brindle color, which is very, very interesting to me. It could be because of the dun. So the dun makes zebra markings on the legs. So it's called bearing. And it makes that line on the back and a little line on the scapula of the horse. He has all of that, but he also has that extra striping on the body. Is there a reason why Dunn uh, is the only color that, uh, that has that kind of uh, mark? Dunn is an, an ancestral eel. So that's a very good question. Um, Dunn is very, very ancient. So the, the first horses, the first ones before domestication, before anything else, they were Duns. So they were basically base, bay based with, uh, with a Dunn allele. And modifications within that Dunn gene led to the, very, the variants that we now know. So ND1 is one type of Dunn, is a variation. And ND2 is the one that doesn't have Dunn markings. But um, we think it was supposedly something that make them better at um, eluding predators, so hiding from predators, right? So if they had zebra-like markings, not on the body, but on the legs, on the back, and they had that dilution, it made them harder to see. So yeah, that's a very good question. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So um, what if you are a horse owner and you don't understand anything about genetics? Well, most genetic testing companies will help you with that information. The company that I used to work for actually sets up um, meetings if you need, and they will set up a meeting to explain and go through the whole panel with you. It's one of their, their perks, let's put it that way. So let's say I tested this horse here, a golden opportunity. And I really like her and she's my favorite horse. She's a, she's a gate, she's a, a jumper horse that I own. And my results came back that way. I don't necessarily need to know everything that's in that panel or understand how it works. I can call the company and say, hey, can you guys walk me through this? I don't really understand it, but it's also always presented in a very simple way. So in this case here, look in red, it's always gonna be something that is slightly more serious. So she is a carrier for fragile full syndrome. And it, does, it means that she doesn't have it, but if she's crossed to something else that has that, the foal can be very severely affected and die right after it's born, or she can lose the pregnancy early on. So it's important for us to know that. And all, look at her co color variation. So she has a cream, she has a W20, she has a bunch of things that I did not expect to have. And this is really good for me. And I can plan on my breedings for her or even my future for her based on the knowledge that I already have. What else can we do with genetics? So we can look at ancestry, just like in humans. So 23andMe, Ancestry.com, all those things. I used to call it in, in a fun way, uh, 32 and you because horses have 64 chromosomes. So 23andMe 
is 32 and U is for the horse. <laughs> so we can look at the ancestry of those individuals. And even between individuals that are full siblings, that ancestry is going to vary slightly. So here's an example of two horses that are full siblings, same dad, same mom. And you can see that there's variation within them. So the top one got some of the Near East ancestry, some of the Arabian, um, Akhaltik, horses from the of it. The top one got some of the X more, the bottom one didn't. So with that information, we can recover lost individuals of a breed because even if there's that slightly variation, the average of the breed will tend to be similar. So you can test horses around that are not registered and see if they fit, if they fit within the profile of that breed and try to recover them for the breed population. So that's very important, especially if we're trying to do some maintenance of genetic diversity, right? And like I said, increase diversity. So maintain that genetic diversity within the population that not all the horses are always gonna look the same genetically because you want them to be healthy. Genetic variation, genet genetic diversity, even if the, the visual is the same, they need to have that genetic diversity in order to be healthy and maintain the breed history. So if you go back and trace a profile of the ancestry of a given breed, you can actually find out things that occurred thousands of years ago within that population. So if there was some introgression of English horses, if there was some introgression of thoroughbreds, when that happened, how that happened, Dr. Sadegi was very, uh, had, had a very interesting publication recently showing that there was a recent introgression of thoroughbreds within the racing Arabian lines. And the reason why they found that out was because there was the Y chromosome that belonged to a thoroughbred. This is interesting. This is maintaining the breed knowledge, the breed history. So we're, we're functioning as, as keepers of that historical accounts. And last but not least, selection. So we had some interesting applications of the ancestry panel. Uh, some breeders use that without any of our input or any of my input personally. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, they have hundreds of horses and they tested all the horses with, with the company, with Edelon. And they did a spreadsheet with each of the ancestries laid out on the spreadsheet and uh, the information the ancestry test was giving them. And they figured out, for example, in certain lineages, certain horses, that having more of the Iberian means that the horses will be better at dressage. And having more of the thoroughbred means that the horses will be better at jumping. So within their own populations, that stands true. And they're selecting horses as soon as they're born based on that information. So instead of wasting four years waiting for the horse to grow up and then sending it to a trainer and then figuring out that the horse doesn't really like that job and it needs a different job. No, they are testing the foals as soon as they are out of the mare and just selecting, hey, this is the one that is going to go for the dressage trainer. This is the one that is going to go for the jumper trainer. And this is the ones that we're going to keep or we're going to sell. Here's an example of something very similar. So two horses from the same breed. So they are both American paint horses here. One is a Rainer, is a triple crown Rainer champion on the right one is a hunter under saddle. They are genetically very different in their ancestry lines. And based on that ancestry, if you take the average for the rainers and if you take the average for the hunters under saddle within that breed, it will almost always stand true. So it's a very good guideline to use in your own population of horses. What do we do with these horses here? What, they're, what are they suited for? Also, we can solve complex parentage issues. So this is a real example here. Um, 
this is one of the breeds that I was talking about that is very similar uh, on the ears. They have the, the ears ends. and not the not the picture of the bottom here, the this gray horse right here, this gray stud. So uh, he was selected in Brazil. He's a very proliferous, very known stallion mare. And uh, a horse owner, a horse breeder used him in his own breeding facility, in his own breeding population. But they overheard that that sire was not truly pedigree wise what the pedigree claimed him to be. So the pedigree said that he was sired by this stud here called Tabachinga Senegal. And what this guy overheard is that this horse actually came from another stud called Favacho Teorema that belonged to a different breed. So he was slightly worried. He was like, are my horses purebreds or are my horses mixed with something else? Can we figure that out? Because we don't have access to any of these three guys anymore. So they send us DNA from four offspring of Giamanchi and from three offspring of Teorema, which technically would be ants to Giamanchi's horses, right? So they would be related as, as an aunt or uncle. All right, so what did we find? So the genetic results were very consistent. The half siblings were all half siblings. They were all within the population that we expected to be half siblings. We had one horse that was uh, an extra horse that I used as a control. So she was from the same breeding facility, but she was from different lineages. And they crossed way back. They crossed in the fourth generation. They crossed up to like six degrees of separation, give or take. But the four horses and the three that belonged to the stud that was a question one, did not have any relationship, which showed us that definitely that stud, that white gray horse was not sired by uh, the one that people were claiming him to be. It was more likely that he was sired by the one in his pedigree. So the owner was very happy. <laughs> well, at least the truth came out and uh, you know that gives the peace of mind and that happens in so many, uh, instances uh yeah as well you know for my horses i have questions as well that those can be answered in, in in that way yes absolutely and we can look into genetics because genetics don't lie so this is the beauty of it um you will know and you can use that information for yourself you can you cannot tell anybody if you don't want to it, it's fine because it's the information is yours the reason why i'm using this example here was because the owners uh, allowed me to. So they gave me permission to show this as an example. So, but yes, you can use that information. Um, there are other instances where we have found that certain horses were, they did not have registration. So the person who purchased that horse did not get the registration for that horse, but she knew that the horse was registered. They just couldn't find the registration for her. So she tested the horse with the company. And what they have now is something called uh, Most Like Me. So it's a kinship analysis that will look up to four generations, fourth degree of separation. And within their own population of horses within the company, they found one horse that was a half sibling to that mare that the, the lady had. Um, and we contacted the owner of the other horse and we asked them if we could share <clears throat> their contact information. So the owner of the mayor that did not have a pedigree reached out to them. They explained where they got the horse from. They told her you can contact this farm. So this is where our horse came from. She reached out to the farm. She told them, hey, I think I have one of your horses horse looked like and they go oh yeah you have so and so would you like her pedigree <laughs> would you like her registration so she, they just gave her the information okay obviously they did not put it on any websites at that time yes nowadays people can find information on websites yeah yeah, well, it wasn't on the website and they couldn't, they, she could not go to the breed association and try to find it at the time. So 
the kinship analysis helped her trace back her horse to where the horse came from, which is very different from when we looked at pedigrees. So if we looked at pedigree only, and this is a real life example too. So these are all Arabian horses from Reeder um, in Germany. They would all be about 30% inbred, right? Give or take. The pedigree is an approximation for what we it doesn't mean that the inbreeding will be the same, and it doesn't mean that the horses will pass on that specific characteristic to the next generation. This is a really good example of it because if we look at the genomic based inbreeding, it goes up to 60s. So these horses are about 60% inbred. It's very high, but this population has been closed for the last 25 years. Okay, so they've been breeding just within that same herd of horses for 25 years. Of course, he does a very good job on maintaining health in his herd. He eliminates any horse that has any genetic problems. And that's why he was able to get to this level of inbreeding without having health issues. But he does have health issues from time to time. But it's very, very different from when we look at just the pedigrees, okay? So we now have better tools. The pedigree was a very good tool, but now we have better tools. And now let's see a, an actual real life example here. Let's, let's put it that way. So I have these three stud geldings here that I'm trying to select for my own population of horses. Which one should I maintain or breed based on my personal or my breed goals? So if my breed association would like more black horses, then maybe I should maintain the black one, right? And get rid of the chestnut ones. Three horses carry. So I would know that this one is a carrier for fragile foal. And he's a carrier also for uh, lower height horses. Maybe something that I want to keep if I'm trying to produce ponies. This one has pearl, but he also has two genetic diseases. I can get rid of those genetic diseases within the next, pop the next generation if I breed him well, if I know what I'm breeding him to. So that's not a big deal. That's okay. And I can maintain the pearl, which is a very pretty color. And this one here, even though he's black, he looks like what my breed would like to maintain. He's a carrier for Aletha White Overo, and he has a cream allele, which means that if I breed him to another horse that has a cream, I might get a horse that is cream with blue eyes. So not necessarily black like my breed wanted, <laughs> but it's there. But if I know the genotype for the mare, I can select her as well and get rid of that within the next generation. So it's all a point of selection. It's all a point of knowing what your horse has. So you can decide if you want to keep it, if you don't want to keep it, if you want to breed it to something that doesn't have that and get rid of it in the next generation and test the foal, test the offspring and see if it has or if it doesn't have it. So I would like to thank you all for bearing with me through this very extensive talk in genetics, even though we were covering just the very basic topics of it. Um, and also thank Paula da Silva for putting me in touch with y'all and uh, letting you know that she has a book out there that is a gorgeous book about the Marwari, the horse of India. And this is a picture from her book, really. I love her pictures. I'm a huge fan of Paula. So yes, thank you very much. And I would take questions now. Thank you, Laura. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Patterson. And I think that's a lovely picture. I don't know when Paula will be photographing my horses. <laughs> She's a very busy person that way. Paula, I still look forward for an opportunity to get my horses yeah. photographed by you. We, we must arrange that someday for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll go with my questions uh, to start with. I think one of the pertinent questions that I have, I've had in my mind throughout the presentation was, how do I est uh, establish a, a breed, right? Now, uh, 
we had certain slides where we saw that you know most of the horses were combination of different uh, breeds and different dnas existed uh, over there so how then can we ascertain or how then can we arrive that a particular breed say for example a marwari or a manipuri or a kathiawadi what does that breed standard be like that's a very good question so a breed is a human construct it's what we think of something. So if we look at a horse and we look at their visual characteristics, we assigned it to a breed. Um, I've seen horses that are technically Mustangs, so feral horses in the United States, that look, they're black and they have um, fur, they have, it's called feathers in their legs. So people look at them, they go like, oh, that's a Frisian horse. It's not a Frisian. It looks like a Frisian, but it's definitely not a Frisian, right? So the first step, what I would say, is establishing what the breed average looks like ancestry-wise, if there are differences, and also the traits that differ between those, those populations of horses. So let's say that one is taller, one is shorter. That is a difference. And then when you establish that, you can look into the genetics, you can look what makes them different, and you can start selecting based on that information. So uh, what most breeds have done is that they go back into the pedigrees, and when the breed was established, they decided to close the books, right? So only horses registered within that breed association or associate are allowed to breed and maintain status as that breed. What we see with genetics is that there are some, there is some overlap between breeds, especially breeds that are historically close together or even interbred in the recent years. Um, I will use an example from Brazil. So there's two breeds in Brazil. One is called the Mangalarga Marchador, and the other one is called the Mangalarga. And they're cousins, they're, uh, they're a cousin breed. Uh, they separated about 40, no, about 90 years ago, give or take. The breed associations really diverged about 80 years ago, 70 years ago. Genetically now, they are very different because they have been selected for different things. But you will still find one or other individual that will overlap both, which is not a bad thing because then you can use that horse to maintain diversity within both breeds, right? Or within the same breed, you can have that variation. So the quarter horses, the paint horses, things like that, that are very genetically distinct within the same breed because you have different functions. So these are breeds focused on the function of the horse, not as much as the, the visual characteristics of them, right? So it all depends. What would you yeah, I think I think your screen froze over there, but I I, uh, I got your answer. So uh, if I go back to uh, Dr. Patterson, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay. So if I go back to uh, an extension of that question, you know, like in the uh, I know the Marwari and the Katiawari were because my horses belong to, to that domain, but there are other breeds of uh, indigenous origin in India. Now, in our world, it's more the phenotype or it's more the physical characteristics that define the horse and they put into a, a breed and they're called purebred or, or not purebred or mixed or whatever for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Now, if if a genetic profiling has to be done, if a, a DNA profiling has to be done to establish what is there exactly in these breeds, uh, what is the sample size that we're looking at? I, I mean, um, is, is it like 10, 15 horses? It's like 500 horses. What is the sample size that we're looking at to establish so, a genetic <laughs> That's That's a good question too. Um, it will, it, everything will differ based on the reference population that you use. Uh, 
So if you use more horses, you'll have a bigger reference population. So you'll have a more broader overview of what that breed looks like. If you use fewer horses, then everything else will have to fit into whatever those fewer horses are. What I would like to do technically is to get different horses from different places that fit within what you consider that population. And that can range from 50 to like 300, 300 to, I don't know, as many as possible within um, financial constraints as well, right? Because we know that there's that limitation for everyone. <laughs> So within that financial limitation, look into what consists of that breed. And a, a breed is a fluid thing too, because with time we change our preferences. Um, and historians actually use horses for that sense too. They, they look at human preference within times of historical times and what the preference when the horses were. So the preference with the breed will change as well with time. And it may be that the horses that are considered the breed nowadays will not be the exact same as the breed in 20 years when you have some development or some more selection. So it will fluctuate, right? But you get a, if you get like the ideal horses, what you consider the ideal horses with different locations within the same country. So let's say in India, you get from uh, a certain city and then you get a different horse from a certain, but it all fit what you think it's the perfect idea for the breed. Then you get a good idea of what you need in the future or what those other horses that are you registering within the breed should be like genetically. Um, yeah, and uh, obviously cost is definitely a factor, especially in the Indian uh, indigenous horse domain where people haven't made that kind of money. You know, they're, they're horse lovers, they keep horses, but they might not, not have that kind of money to invest in uh, getting all the details. I mean, your presentation was an eye opener. There's so much that we can do with uh, DNA testing and genetics and everything. And I'm sure in it the is... years to come, you know, people will come up yeah. uh, with an app that we can put on a horse. Uh, and uh, get the <laughs> genetics like that. But till that time, how, how, uh, or if this science can be made affordable uh, is, is, is the question. Do you think yes. there is, there is a, a, you know, light at the end of the tunnel to say that, you know, this can be affordable and, you know, someone like me, who has 18 horses, can send samples of all of them and get them tested or whatever. But there are others, uh, you know, hundreds of them out there, uh, small farmers keeping the horses for their love of it, but really would like to do all that the DNA and the genetics can do for it, but just can't. They can't take the so, next step. There are ways to work around that. So it is a technically more way more affordable than it was 10 years ago or five years ago even um and one of the reasons is that um with with the, the company that i am a, a scientist and now i'm taking my professor hat off and putting my scientific consultant hat on so uh with the company that i'm a scientific consultant at Elon, what we try to do is get the broad panel so instead Instead of knowing uh, one or two or three things and paying $50 for each one of them, um, what the company decided to do is do like a full panel approach. So you send in the hair sample and it's a hair sample. It's nothing too complicated. You don't need to send blood or a piece of the horse. You know, <laughs> It's just a hair sample from the mane or the tail and you get the whole thing. You get everything that is ever tested for within the same panel. That's the idea because it makes it easier for people to, first of all, decide what kind of information is useful for them. If they have extra information, it's extra information. It's not a bad thing. And also you get a full profile of that individual animal. Uh, right now, I think it's about 159 for the full panel US dollars. 
And because of exchange rates, and I am aware of that, like Brazil, for example, the exchange rate is very bad right now. The currency in Brazil is not very good. So the exchange rate gets it very expensive to the Brazilians. Um, there are things that we as horse owners can do. We can select uh, just a few horses within our herd to test. We can test just the, the horses that will be producing offspring in the next year, let's say. We can test just for the stud to begin with. So the stallion that we're using because he will be bred to more mares than individual mares. So if we find something with the stud, then we can test individual mares to try to figure out things. Um, and last but not least, there are breed associations around the world that are taking upon them to run these tests because they want to maintain the breed health. They want to maintain the breed characteristics. So the color, the phenotypes that we like, and they want to maintain the genetics of that breed. So for example, um, I think it was the standard bread or the, the standard bread. Um, they're having horses that are being registered as, as um, open book or half standard breads tested ancestry wise to try to figure out if they actually are half bred or if they're full bred horses that can go back into the breeding population right away. So that's that's one step that the breed association is taking to make sure that that population is still ongoing and that they have more horses registered because it also is good for the breed, right? To have more horses registered as a breed. So there, there are different ways to do that. Uh, I think it also depends on the, I think it's, it's it, it uh, very uh, largely depends on the maturity of the, the breed associations as well, you know? Some of them would not like to go in for it because their beliefs might be shattered. And we're dealing with some of, we might be dealing with some of them uh, at home as well. It, anyways, it's always like point, that. Good, good point over there. It's always like that. It's always like that. So um, what I try to explain is that I had that situation with the breed in Brazil. They were not very happy with the results, with the ancestry results. And I try to explain to them that the ancestry results are not supposed to fit what you believe it's the breed. They show you a picture of what your horse truly is. So if that horse is your ideal, then that's the genetics you want. It's not the other way around, right? You're not trying to put that horse into this beautiful, perfect ancestry that it looks exactly like you expected it to look. No, it's it's whatever that horse has that needs to be what is the ideal. Absolutely. Uh, then my other question, my last question to you would be for now, is uh, the nukra, as we call it, you know, the, the breed with the pink skin and the blue eyes or black eye or whatever. If that is the result from a breeding, would that be a reason to call it or establish a new breed with, with those horses? Or does that not qualify to be a breed at all on it, on, on its um, I think you're cutting a little bit, but I think I got your question. I don't know if it's me. I hope it's not me. <laughs> I can't hear too. Oh, okay. So it's not me then. All right. So um, I think I got the question. So the idea here is if the Nucra uh, as bred from other breeds or other individuals should be uh, its own... Bad. Um, I'm going to wait for him to finish. Oh, I think we lost them all. Hello? I think he can go ahead and answer his question because it'll be recorded. 
Oh, all right. All right. Yes, that's a good idea. Okay. So I think like the idea here is if we should maintain the nucra as a breed, since it's coming from different horses sometimes, uh, but it has a different phenotype. And it's like I said, the breed is a, is a human construct. So what do we consider as a breed? Is it because of the color? Is it because of different characteristics? Do we want to isolate that population and make it into its own thing? If yes, to all of the above, then yes, probably would want to um, start building the idea of Nucra as its own separate breed. And maybe you can have an open book for horses that carry the traits that the Nucra wants to mean the whites, but not necessarily have that characteristic themselves. So they're carriers, but they can still be bred to Nucras and produce horses that look like the Nucra wants them to be, right? And that's how most of breeds start, really. That's that's a human idea of, I like this thing and I'm going to breed it until it looks like what I want. <laughs> but can two Nukras be bred to be an, uh, a foal which is not Nukra? Um, maybe. Maybe. So where does that foal, even if it is maybe, where does that foal belong to? Yes, so it would be kind of like the conundrum that the paint horses have right now, right? So the American paint horse technically wants horses that have white spots or white patches on their bodies. And sometimes a breeding between two horses that have white patches makes a horse that doesn't have white patches. It happens. It still gets registered as a stock. So it's, it's registered as a solid within the paint horse. It's still allowed to compete. It's still allowed to breed, but it's registered within a different part of the book, within a different book within the association. So they don't lose that genetic diversity. They're not missing that horse. They're not refusing the, the existence of that horse, but they know that it will need to be bred to something else in order to get the trace that they want. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. I think those will be my questions uh, for now. Any other questions from any of uh, the participants here for Dr. Patterson? Yes, uh, Vimal, I also have some questions for Laura. Laura? Yes. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Laura, when we talk about any experiment, whether it is uh, it deals with microbiology, whether it deals with animal experiment, we always have a control, isn't it? It is highly recommended to have a control to understand whether whatever we are doing is getting successful. So if you are talking about uh, uh, genome manipulation in, in horses, so what type of control should be there to understand that whatever manipulation we are doing is going in a right way? That's a very good technical question. Thank you. So um, if we're thinking about controls for horses, so first and foremost, if we're thinking about ancestry, we're comparing horses to the whole wild world breeds of horses around there. Um, and that's the reference population. Okay. So if we have that okay. reference population, that reference population serves as a reference to be able to tell us with uh, within that population of horses worldwide, where do our horses fall into, right? So what genetics they share with which populations, with which breeds. And these horses that serve as a reference, they are known breeds, they're registered horses, they're all from the same idea background. Um, that's what the Edelon has used, for example, and that's what most scientists have used. There are several publications looking into um, genomics of ancestries and breed uh, and breed genetics that looked into that population idea. If we're looking at genetic variations, there is a reference genome. So the picture of the horse that is actually in the advertisement for, for this session here. So that's our reference genome for the horse. Twilight is a thoroughbred mare. She was used as the genome sequence, the first genome sequence for a horse, and she is now the reference genome used for comparison with other breeds. And some of the things work really well. Some of the things didn't work all that well. For example, she's a gray when people were trying to find out what gray was. 
it was kind of hard because the reference genome was also a grace. So what do you compare her to? You compare her to non-grace to try to figure out what's going on. Um, in the case of the native breeds, I don't think that will be an issue what twilight is. Um, if we're looking at specific variations, so let's say the dominant whites that the nucra have, what are they? Are they the same ones that we already know? The 34, one, two, three, through, through all the way 34. Then we test the causative variant for that. Or if it's not none of those 34, if it's not any of those 34, then we looked into their own genetics and try to figure out within the candidate genes, within the candidate genomic locations, if there's something in there that is different from twilight and that is unique to that horse. And then that same thing get tested on thousands of horses to be able to confirm that. Make sense? Okay. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank You're you so welcome. much. And one more thing, Alara. Uh, for example, there are different technologies like CRISPR-Cas and other stuff too for gene manipulation, isn't it? A lot of publication was there. And... Uh, it is also being used for, for human genetic manipulations. So is it the same technology that we use for equine as well? Oh, no, we're not doing CRISPR at this moment with horses. There are some groups doing studies with CRISPR, but if if you if we're messing with CRISPR, Cas9, that kind of thing, so we're looking to changing the genetic sequences of, of living or embryos, things like that. True, so true, we're true, true. Yes, we're not doing that. We're looking at genetic variations that already exist within populations. So it's like uh, genome-wide association analysis or candidate gene sequences or exon sequences, targeted sequences, mm, things like that. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Because, uh, because it would have been like that. My next question was about ethics. Because I was thinking oh. when, when you were going through the, the slides, I was thinking that is it ethically possible? Because whenever we are doing any animal experiment, we have to have those ethics clearance. Yes. When we are no, using we... human samples, even samples, we yes. have to have those ethics clearance and it takes year, at least six to seven months it takes to We're... get it clear. Not, not, not just the, the CRISPR. So any, any genetic studies has to have an ethics. Yes. committee which is an ethics committee that oversees yes. that the horses being collected are healthy and safe and good and that we're not harming or damaging them in any way but uh genetic testing the way that i was mentioning today during the talk is done with dna extractions from hair most of the time okay okay so, yes yeah. yes it's just pulling a little bit of hair from the mane or tail, and they don't even notice that you're doing that most of the times. They don't care. So, yeah. And can I ask you one more thing? Is there any specific age of collection? Like, um, because, I, because the DNA remains the same throughout the life, but is it there any age which, which should be appropriate for collection of those genes or do dominant oh. genes? No, it stays, it stays the same. If the horse is a newborn or if it's a 50, 34 year old gelding that is in the pasture, it's going to stay the same. If you collect hair from the mm. tail or mane, there are genetic variants or, or uh, genetic components that change with time, but those are more correlated, correlated to uh, genomic age. So methylation sites, things like that, that we're not going to get into. Um, but there is variation, not for this purpose. Okay. okay. The only thing okay. that I, I try to tell owners is uh, newborn foals. Uh, for some reason, they, they tend to have a lot of the damn DNA spread over them. So sometimes oh. we might get a little bit of, of um, uh, a leftover DNA from the mom when we're, we're running the analysis. So we usually recommend that maybe you can wash the tail and then wait it for it to dry and then pull the hair so you don't get that contamination mm. from the mom. Okay, okay. That's a smart thing. It was a very nice presentation, Laura, very informative, and I really enjoyed it, seriously. Thanks.
Thank you, Vartika. Thanks for those questions. Any other questions from the participants? So I will take that as a no. Uh, I have one question and that's uh, for Dr. Rahi. Dr. Rahi, uh, we understand that you did uh, those studies in the Arabian racehorses where you find traits of uh, the thoroughbred. Yeah. What followed? What happened after that, uh, that results <laughs> was published? Oh, <laughs> I think Sam's can, Sam can explain it. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's not easy to report that. Uh, uh, we sent the paper to different uh, journals and uh, with some bad comments, and uh, it was very hard to publish it. Uh, you know that it's hard to report these kind of things to the owners. And uh, I also heard your questions about the uh, financial issues you will have with the breeders. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Patterson, this kind of question we, we are uh, face every day. But uh, in Iran, um, uh, we formed the breeds, the na native breeds like Darashuri, Kurdish, and uh, the Caspian horse. We form, we, uh, the Federation started to form the breeds uh, about uh, seven years ago. Uh, and because of this kind of a financial problem that uh, most of the native uh, owners, uh, na native owners has, uh, we started with, with microsatellite mar markers. So we formed the, uh, we make a, made a reference population and uh, we just compared each horse, uh, unknown horse with this uh, reference population. But uh, as the time goes and for uh, the stallion selection, we uh, encourage the owners to use the SNP chip data and uh, what Dr. Patterson uh, uh, explained to you. So uh, I think if you have this kind of pro problems like a financial uh, problem and most of owner uh, don't, don't agree to pay, uh, they, they don't care. In the first days, they don't even care. Mm, they say, okay, you take my uh, horse hair sample and uh, you report some uh, something that, that is not true. So I understand the first stages are very difficult. But uh, if you follow it, um, then when you make a population, then you can use this kind of test of uh, start with stallion, then broodmares, and then the other breeders uh, follow it. Uh, when when they, they see their reports, they encourage to do it, uh, all of them. Yeah. Uh... I think I'll I'll uh, I'll get in touch with you and understand that, that a bit more because you know the aspect of our projects we might land up in same kind of a situation so perhaps there's some learning that uh, I can take uh, from you over there. But if there are no other questions, uh, uh, let me see the chat box. I don't see any questions. Uh, um. Can I just, just make a comment based on what Rahi said too? Um, so Absolutely, yeah. Also with Brazil. So I still, I'm still contacting uh, breeders in Brazil. I'm still wor working with the Brazilian breeds as well, native. For time, not only with the financial aspect, but also with, um, why do I want that information? Because that's like, just based on what I'm seeing. So why do I care? Um, and second, when they looked into the actual ancestry results, a lot of them disagreed with it. A lot of them didn't like the results. And it's an educational thing. So it's an ongoing thing that you're educating them to see this is not something to go against your beliefs. This is not something to make things harder for you. This is something to make things easier for you. So you have to get these tools and use them the way you want. So um, it's not that you're going to have to report that to anybody or you're going to have to do this or that. It's, it's a matter of using that information. And now we're getting a breakthrough. So now horse owners are starting to understand the good things, the good aspects about genetic testing. So um, we had one recent example of somebody who tested his stallion 
and it's a it's a stud colt, and they they breed Tobiana horses, so horses that have white spots, and they really like the black ones with black with white spots. And his horse came back homozygous for the black, homozygous for Tobiano, so meaning that they have to, they will always pass it for the next generation, always, 100% of the time they will pass that forward. But he also came back with, as a carrier for a genetic disease. And he was very upset at first. And then I explained to him, you know now, you don't have to wait 11 months to find out. So now that you know, maybe you test the brood mares that you're gonna use with him. And then his offspring, so his sons, will be like him in the sense that they will pass on the genetics of the good things that you want, but they won't have the genetic disease. So it's it's a breakthrough. It, it's a work thing. You, you have to keep talking to them. You have to keep explaining. Things are not bad. They are just more informative. Yes. I just hope I could do that in my lifetime. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, Dr. Patterson, that was a wonderful uh, session uh, uh, from your side. And I think that's just a start of a long lasting relationship that uh, we'll have on the project with you. Um, I, I think there's a lot to fathom over there. There's a, there's a lot to digest over there. I'll you know watch these, uh, this session again and again, at least a few times to understand and you know take the next steps with my own horses but it's it's been wonderful uh, to be talking to you and uh, the session thank you so much for your thank time you. yes thank, thank you. you for having me here and thank you for all the participants as well uh, the video will be available on youtube uh, i will be distributing the link uh, of the youtube uh, video once we have put it on and I think, you know, this kind of information is what we want as knowledge base to exist and for people to understand and for people to take further, you know, in their own pursuit of uh, uh, equine excellence. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Patterson.